Okay, uh, let's continue with our uh, amazing duo that I'm going to present now. They're the first two speakers of uh, the day. So I'm going to present you um, Martina Mojina. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Martin. I said Martina because I was looking at you. Martin Mojina, lead data scientist at Mercator DD, and Petra Hajduković, director of BI and CRM at MSTART. Uh, how did they implement data science in their everyday work? They will tell us themselves. So please give them a warm round of applause. Okay. No, not yet. Yeah, now it's better. Okay, um, hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Petra, and together with my colleague Martin, we will present to you our Fortinova Data Lab. And uh, one of the use cases that we are working on for now almost a year. Let's start with a short introduction about us. So, uh, Fortinova Group is the largest retail and food producer in the region. We are operating in five countries here in this region, and we are employing almost uh, 50,000 people. Um, we have five retailers inside our group and more than two and a half thousands of sales locations and distribution centers. So retail is roughly 60% of our business, but inside our group we also have very strong uh, meat and beverage production, uh, oil production, agriculture also, and a lot of other um, companies with different areas. So I think that this really gives us a great advantage when we are talking about the data and information that we can share on the group level. So. Um, for now, you can see here a couple of important numbers for us because I'm not sure that uh, you are familiar with how much of the data we actually really have. So here you can see the number of our monthly um, customers that we have, yearly number of our transactions, and the number of our loyalty card users. Then there you have 16, po uh, um, 16 and a half million is the number of sessions on our online shop. But what is important for us here today is that behind these numbers is, of course, valuable data and information that we have and use to better understand consumption habits of our customers, um, optimize our processes, and to really drive the, the, the long-term some sustainable success. So, um, following our digital transformation strategy that is defined and approved on a group level, Data is becoming really strategic priority for us. So therefore, we are consolidating all data science capabilities in a form of central of excellence. And um, today, I think that we are somewhere in a point where companies like Carrefour or X5 were two to three years ago. And uh, here on this slide, you can see how this digital transformation was done in some other retailers. And we are just following the good examples of them. So um, we really hope that, uh, that uh, we will succeed. We started a year ago with this program, but a lot of things is still in front of us. Our main, vis uh, our main mission in our data lab, uh, first of all, is to build foundations. So what this means? Um, it means that we want to collect the data, merge the data, structure, clean the data from different sources, and we want to build central analytical cloud-based platform. Uh, we are doing that in partnership with Google, um, and that platform should be used by all companies within the Fortinova group. Uh, we already did that, and we have now GCP put in place, but a lot of work is still in front of us. Um, the second, our mission is to build a data-driven decision-making culture. So uh, we aim to do that by making data more accessible to everyone who really needs it. So just a few clicks away. So this is a goal uh, that we want to achieve. And this is something that we can deliver in a form of maybe some real near-time um, uh, dashboards or maybe some more complex tools like uh, assortment optimization tool or promotion tool or something similar to that. Our third mission is to, to become agile in delivering data products to our business stakeholders. So we just want to move away from this classical delivering project that we were doing, let's say, un until now. 
So, uh, many areas of Fortinova Group uh, have potential to be transformed through the data, but we decided to start with uh, high-impact use cases in retail, because together with our business, uh, we clearly identified three key priority areas that we will be tackling inside our data lab. So, here we are talking about assortment optimization, uh, promotion optimization, and demand forecasting and replenishment. Uh, the last one is the one that now we will present to you in more details. So, uh, when we are talking about demand forecast, uh, one of the main, let's say, more challenging areas is fresh food forecast, but uh, improving accuracy of demand for fruits and vegetables leads to less waste and gives better quality and availability of goods. So automatically, it leads to cost cutting and at the same time to customer satisfaction. So it's really clear why this area is something that we need to, to really be focused on. So um, to, to better understand the challenge that we have, maybe I will go back here, uh, let's put a couple numbers here. So in Konzum Croatia, uh, we have more than 600 locations. In each store, when we are talking about fruits and vegetables, we have almost 200 um, different products. We need to have forecast for next 90 days. So 90 days ahead, we need to have a forecast. So with simple math, we see that we are talking about uh, more than 5 million forecasts that we need to have every day. Of course, the forecast needs to be good. And to achieve that, we need to take into account prices, um, uh, discounts, promotions, um, uh, days of week, um, public holidays, and a lot of others demand drivers. But at the same time, we need to be aware that, for example, uh, different locations can have totally different sales patterns, although we are talking about the same product and same time period. So here we have an example for bananas, so simple product, bananas. Uh, and we, uh, we here see on a graph two different locations. First one is in Zagreb, and the second one is um, on a coast. Um, it's Krk Island. So you can see that the pattern, sales pattern, is really different, although we are talking about the same product and same time frame. The reason for that is that, um, the, let's say, demand is something that depends on different elements. So, for example, tourist season, I think that's clear, because for countries like Croatia, it's very important if the store is located on a coast or somewhere inside. Then, for example, weather, uh, maybe some events that are happening around the location that we are looking at. Uh, very important also is uh, structure of popu population um, in the area where this location is. Because, for example, you can see that on a first graph, you have a couple of peaks that you don't have on a second one. And the reason for that is uh, that the location of first store is, let's say, similar to New Belgrade here, where in Zagreb we have maybe older population. And these peaks are effects of pension days. And this is something that we don't have on a second uh, graph, where the location is on a coast and where we have a different population. So I think it's really clear that uh, we are talking about a uh, really complex subject that we need to cover, and our models need to really recognize all of that to be good, of course, to have a good forecast. Okay, uh, different. This one? Okay, uh, I already said, so um, there are a lot of direct and indirect impacts of good uh, forecast, and you can see the impact is both on revenue and margin, then we have on inventory levels, and maybe even more important in the long term on uh, customer retention. So I think it's really clear why this demand forecast, especially on fruits and vegetables, is one of our key priority areas that we are tackling in inside our data lab. Now I will give a word to Martin and he will explain you in more details about our models and implementation of those. Okay, thank you, Petra. So, Please hold us. Um, in this second part, uh, we'll see how we carried out demand forecasting first in Konzum, and now we are also implementing it in Mercator. Mm, to begin with, 
both companies are already using the main forecasting. It's not new to them. Here are some methods they are using. The first two methods underlined are this classical statistical time series forecasting method, where you simply, when you want to forecast future sales, look at just uh, history sales. And uh, this is something that we didn't really like. Not we didn't like just to be focused on just sales and having so many methods uh, in our systems. So what we did at the beginning, somehow framed four objectives that we would like to get with our modeling. First objective would be we would like to have a single model. So a single model that can predict sales in all stores for all SKUs or items. Then we would like to use also some external data, not just historic sales data, because with that, we expect more accuracy. We would also like that our model is capable of predicting both regular sales and promo sales. And the last objective uh, is, okay, that we would like this machine learning model, developed machine learning model, to be capable to predict more than uh, just one day in advance, so several days ahead. Before I tell you how we implement that, let me just re reiterate again. We have really a lot of data. I mean, just from operations. So, in, uh, so we have internal data just from operations. Then we have a lot of external data, like prices of competition, weather data, some specific events, whatever. And then we also have inferred data. So really a lot of data that's already used somewhere in some, some reports. And why is this important to us? Because this is all a source for features. And you know that in this basic traditional machine learning, where you have instances as rows and then columns as features, features are the most important thing that you have to implement. Be because basically when you have this, you put them in some model, like we are using EGBoost, set some target value, in our case it sells, and you will fit the model, which you can use further than for, um, for forecasting. Now, I will tell you that with just Clever feature engineering, we can solve all those four objectives. How? First objectives, to have uh, one model. Okay, simply have one instance represent one store, one item, and then add features that will describe stores, whether they are seasonal or not seasonal, and so on, and features which will describe items. The second objective, how to include external data. Very, very simple. Just add external data into features. Third objective, promo. If you want to also forecast promo sales, add promotional features. What's the promotional price? What's the type of promotion do you have? All can go into the features. Now, this fourth objective is a bit more trickier. I have a slide for that. Because how can we just, um, how can we forecast several days ahead just by using features? Because Let's see this uh, graph here. We have some historic cells, and then we would like to forecast this horizon of 90 days. Classical machine learning is capable of predicting one value. And uh, when you do this traditional approach, there are actually two approaches, how to do time series forecasting several days ahead. You can you, you, you usually use either recursive method, basically forecast one day, move one day ahead, focus next day, and so on, 90 times. The other approach is having 90 models. One model will uh, focus one day ahead, the next one two days, and so on. Both these two approaches have one problem. They are difficult to maintain. In the first one, you have to make 90 predictions, call the same model 90 times, and in the, the other one, you have to contain 90 models. Now, our, our solution is to add the feature which contains horizon. So now you have a feature, let's say horizon 90, or 10, or 12, or 20, and the model by itself has to figure out which of the other features are now important for forecasting short term ahead or long term ahead. Of course, you can also add additional features. You have two dates. You have this uh, forecast date and target date. You can add lag features just relevant to the first one and lag features relevant to the second date. So this is all a uh, possibility that you have. So 
when you have it in a setting like that, then your forecasting problem just reduces to having 90 days in the forecasting table. For each day, uh, for each uh, uh, row in this table, you have a different horizon. Put it in a model and you will get forca forecasts. Okay, that's theoretical. Now we know that with features we can solve these problems. How do we implement features? Um, you have already seen everyone this kind of machine learning process of a, or some form of this process. You also know that it's never just that simple going from problem definition to evaluation and production, but you always have to loop. We always have these loops. Why do we have loop? Because when we get to uh, evaluation, we see that our model has a problem. There is, you can pinpoint some parts of the space where your model fails to predict accurately. You will have to solve that problem. Usually it's either with a new feature or with some bug fix of the data. That will, I have been doing now very long. It's these two, um, these two reasons in most of cases. Uh, let's say in our first uh, iteration, we found out that our model is incapable of um, modeling weekly dynamics. So it, it's not uh, able to distinguish well with, between days in the week. And we had to add some features to solve that. Then uh, after a while, we came to another problem that our model is not able to correctly forecast start of the season. So in fruits and vegetables, you have this problem that start of the season is not fixed. It's not the same every year. So if last year started on this day, it could start 14 days uh, before that or later of that this year. So, uh, and in the first case, we solved it just simply by reprogramming. In the second case, we had to involve uh, our users, domain users, which is in our case, category managers, who now have to provide us with the date they approximately think when the season will start. Okay, maybe just one sentence. Uh, what I also would like to mention here with this looping, so Petra said before that we are now um, going into agile methodology. And I was really surprised, but agile methodology works really well with this looping of this process. Why? Simply because you are forced every 14 days, which is a sprint, to deliver something, which means some loop of that, and you are forced to speak to your users. And uh, in projects where you're not forced to speak to, to your users, it happens so many times. I was part of such project that we started talking to users too late. Now here you are forced to do it before that. That's a good thing. Okay, just a few more sentences about how, um, um, how we evaluate. So now we talk about this process, we, get with, we end up with new features. How we evaluate that a new feature is acceptable to our model? First condition is very simple. Let's see if the accuracy of the new model improved or the error decreased. That's simple. The second one is basically looking at the data. Is your new feature having uh, the intended effect? That means Look at the problematic areas which you discovered before and see whether they're now fixed. This is, let's say this is an example. This is an example um, of tangerines from a um, consume store in Samovar. The black dots, the actual cells. The blue and the red uh, lines, are the blue uh, is the previous model, the red line is the new model with a new feature. Now what you can see is that both models here quite well were able quite well to predict the actual set. So this is all done out of time. It's not uh, uh, on learning data, right? Uh, in some case, uh, in, I mean, the prediction is fairly good. But the difference between two models is here, here at the beginning. Now the new model with this new feature getting from category managers when the season will start, is able to more accurately start predicting the start of the season. Okay, this is one thing, two things, and the third thing that we uh, have to check is what the model thinks about the feature. You have uh, heard a lot about shape values and shape visualizations. We're also using that. Um, basically what you do is look at this 
feature, whether the model thinks it's important or not. If it is important, then um, it means that this feature is not working just for the uh, cases that you, s that you have seen problematic, but also in general. Okay. Okay, that's it. Then you do this looping, and then you have to stop. You end up with some set of feature. Let's say that this is it, just a subset of it. And at that point, you have to go to implementation of the model. Before you go into the implementation of the model, you have to correctly evaluate it against the current production model. Um, and, and then you will end up with a graph like that, something like that. So here, um, these two curves represent errors of two models. The green is the production model. The blue one is the new model to be implemented. And this is done across different groups of items. So here we were quite happy. The, mod the new model is clearly an improvement across all groups and decided to go into implementation. Implementation of this part um, for model building I mentioned before XGBoost, we do it in Python. And for everything else, basically, we're using cloud, Google Cloud Tools. <coughs> um, here's maybe just one sample of um, uh, how our model is integrated in Google Cloud, starting at the top with feature generation, storing it in BigQuery, then um, uh, loading the model, putting everything in several vertex AI machines, which parallel then create forecasts, and at the end, aggregating it in another big query table. You've seen that we need daily 5 million predictions, which is then ready for, let's say, just analysis of a category manager, or um, when the uh, when we implemented it, it to, the end, uh, to the end, this was then also sent automatically into our replenishment process. The replenishment process then takes predictions and generates um, sorry, um, and generates actual orders that uh, will uh, go. So, how much items should be sent to each store? Okay, uh, maybe just. Another, uh, s some words about monitoring, like the colleague before mentioned, yes, monitoring is very important. I mean, this is a serious system. Of course, we all understand the serious system. Um, it's used by many s uh, stores, and you don't want to anything to go wrong. You have to at least monitor that your model is stable, so that your data is stable, that you don't diverge into some uh, um, degradations of the model. So um, uh, here we implemented some dashboards for that, just to s monitor the model. And another dashboard um, uh, comes from the fact that they will not, so it's normal, but the um, management was not willing to use this model on all stores at once. We have 600 stores. In Kuzum, they have 600 stores. But uh, here we started with only 13 stores. What you then do, OK, then you have to Compare these 13 stores with some control group um, before and after the change, and see whether the change in test group was uh, pref preferable to the control group. So is it better? And in our case, it was. Um, so therefore, just a few days ago, we were allowed to extend these 13 stores to 16 stores. We have seen mainly, uh, 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 so the main advantage the main improvement was in terms of acceptance rate. What does it mean? The store managers, when they get their order, they can either accept or uh, change it with their own order. They say, OK, I don't agree with whatever system calculated. I want to say, uh, set an another number for this order. So the acceptance rate, rate here really went up. And um, we've also seen improvements in terms of other business KPIs like revenue, out of stock, wastage, and so on. Okay, this is now uh, the last slide. I will uh, wrap up. Mm -hmm. What I would like to uh, just reiterate to, to rem for you to remember. So we started this data lab. We, uh, our job, so one of our jobs, is also to um, create a data science community within Fortanova. Um, 
we are using state-of-the-art tools. And if you ask me from a data science point of view, the most appealing thing working on problems like that is to have the actual, to see the actual impact. I mean, your job is to make the model more accurate, then you put the model into production, and then you see business impact of your more accurate model. Um, okay, at the same time, I would like everyone who liked what we presented, um, uh, it may be to apply for a job. We are now recruiting. We are a new company within Fortanova. We are looking for uh, all sorts of profiles like data scientists, data engineers, DevOps, product owners, data analysis, practically everything. So thank you very much. We maybe have time for just one short question before the coffee break, so if anyone is interested, okay, you, you may be the one. <laughs> I will give you my mic. For the model that uses the forecast horizon feature, are the lagged variables all the same? For all like the, like you don't use predictions as like Yes. Okay. Yes. I, they are all relative to this prediction date. To the yeah, on, last on actual date. Yeah, the last actual date, yes. Thank okay, you. that was short, so maybe <laughs> we can take another one. <laughs> yeah, here you go. Um, what is the time horizon you use for training the model? For example, the last year or? Yes, um, so we used more data before, but then we decided just due to Corona and all these uh, uh, specific effects to use a little, a bit. So last year plus some few months, so. And additional question, how, how often do you update the model? Because oh, um, at the moment, we are still in developing phase, so we are updating it regularly whenever we have new updates. But uh, the plan is, when we finish with this, to uh, retrain it every month. OK, thank you. Petra and Martin, thank you so much. I think that everybody will catch you uh, outside during the coffee break. <laughs>